to our first event in our short course. Um, so if you don't know, Students for Global Health is kind of a national in the UK body and there's different branches across um, the country. So we're the King's College London branch and these short courses have kind of been um, a staple to the Students for Global Health kind of projects, I suppose. Um, and the, this year, our overarching theme is focusing on kind of health, um, global health and marginalised populations. So we have six events across our short course. So today they're all going to be running on a Tuesday. Um, so for the next six weeks. So today is our Global Health and Disability Journal Club. Next week, we'll be talking about LGBTQ plus experiences in healthcare. Um, the week after that, we'll be talking about health and homelessness, uh, reducing um, barriers and tackling inequity. Then moving on to March to celebrate International Women's Day, we'll be talking about gender based violence and COVID-19. Then on the 16th of March, we'll be talking about prisoner health and we'll be looking at the Prison Doctor Book Club and we'll have some experts to come in and speak about um, some of the global health issues in the prisoner population. And lastly, to finish off our short course, we have a fantastic speaker who's going to come and speak to us about migrant health. So these are our six events. As I said, there's one um, overarching theme and we'd love for you to come to all of the events but obviously it's quite a big commitment to come every week so we will have feedback forms at the end of each event so there'll be one at the end of today and if you attend four out of these six events and complete the feedback form then we can provide you with a certificate to say that you've um, participated in this short course with us um, so yeah we're really looking forward to all the speakers we have lined up for you um, and we will be sharing if you're joined up via the Google form, we'll be sending the Zoom links out to you via email. If not, we'll also be posting them on the Facebook events the day before the event starts. So welcome to our short course and this is our first event. So the outline of how tonight's going to run. So I'm just going to run through a little bit of background on global health and disability. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the World Report on Disability and what the key findings for that were. I'm just going to give a very quick, brief clinical example of why it's relevant, not just to global health, but also for those of us that are clinical in, in the UK, how disability is important um, in that respect. Then we're going to have a journal article presentation by Saloni, who's going to quickly present the article that kind of this session is based around. So if you haven't read it, no worries, we'll give you a, a rundown of what was in it. And then we're going to have a little bit of a discussion in some groups to talk about what we thought about the article and what we're going to take away from it. And then we'll conclude and have some feedback. Okay, so first, absolute basics, but the most important to have the fundamentals. So what is a disability? So I took this definition um, from the government website. So this is what they define a disability within the UK, but obviously each country will have different um, definitions and actually it was quite hard to find a very international definition but in the UK it says you're disabled under the Equality Act 2010 if you have a physical or mental impairment that has a substantial and long-term negative effect on your ability to do normal daily activities. So the World Report on Disability this was published in 2011 and there hasn't been an update on it so far. So this is kind of the last full um, report. It was jointly produced by the WHO, so the World Health Organization and the World Bank. And it was actually the first document to outline the global picture of people with disabilities. So actually only 10 years ago, did we have a very comprehensive look at what it means to have a disability. And actually, only 10 years ago, did we actually have an accurate prevalence of disabilities globally. And this report was very much pushed and supported by Professor Stephen Hawking, who I think was a very key figure in um, getting this key document to be produced. So the kind of key figures that came out of this report, firstly, 15% of the world's population lives with a disability. Um, which was higher than they first anticipated before they created the survey. 
and actually two to four percent of those with a disability experience severe difficulties in functioning. Prevalence of disability is increasing and it's increasing globally and this is due to ageing populations in a lot of um, countries as we well know and also an increased burden of chronic health conditions such as diabetes, cardiovascular disease. And actually a large majority of those with a disability are from developing countries. So that was a key um, finding they, they got on this report. So what were the key findings and take home messages? So I will leave a link to this report at the end of the, um, the presentation and we can share it on the Facebook event. And they have a really good summary and fact sheet that brings all these out. So the key messages they highlighted. First was a need for a shift in thinking about disability from medical terms to social understandings. So rather than thinking about um, a disability as say a loss in vision, we need to kind of shift our mindset to think about what a disability means in social terms, so in, in someone's social functioning in society. Next, as we spoke about before, prevalence of disability is high and it is growing. Next is that disability disproportionately affects vulnerable groups such as women, elderly and low income groups. Disability is diverse in its presentation and also its impacts. So as much as it's really good to get these prevalent statistics, um, we need to be very careful and not kind of homogenizing the disability experience. And it needs to be appreciated that not only its presentation, but also the way it impacts people's lives is extremely diverse. They kind of emphasise that people with mental health difficulties or intellectual impairments are generally more excluded in society than those with physical disabilities. So this was in terms of stigma, healthcare accessibility, and also things like access to the labour market. And lastly, one of the take home messages was people with disabilities have worse health and socioeconomic outcomes. And that's because of these barriers to um, kind of optimal care that they highlighted. So the barriers they identified that contributed to these um, difficulties in health and socioeconomic outcomes are inadequate policies and standards negative attitudes towards disability, so both within the public and also within professionals, a lack of provision of services, and also poor service delivery of those services that are available, inadequate funding for people with disabilities, lack of accessibility, so that's things um, like lack of accessibility to services, to the labour market, to education, but also physical accessibility. So are there ramps for you to be able to access bank buildings or for you to be, be able to access workplaces? Lack of consultation and involvement. And I think this was a big um, part that I took away from the document was how there is very little involvement of lived experience. So people who are currently living with disabilities have very little involvement in the policies and the laws that affect them. And that was a big part of the kind of report that they wanted to improve on. And then also you've got lack of research and data, which I think is kind of the key highlight of the, the journal article that we'll go on to discuss was the difficulties in the research and data in this population group. So they came up with some key recommendations from this report on disability. So the first was to enable access to all mainstream systems and services, to invest in programmes and services specifically for those with disabilities. Countries should all adopt a national disability strategy and plan of action, and to involve people with disabilities in law and policy making processes. There's also a few more. So to improve training and education surrounding disabilities. So this is specifically within they highlighted healthcare professionals and also architects when you come to designing um, cities, designing buildings, because that physical accessibility was actually a major part in the exclusion from society. To provide adequate funding to services, which means that there's less 
and fewer financial barriers to accessing optimal care. Increased public awareness and understanding of disability. And the last two are to improve the availability of data on disability and support further research on disability, which again, I think are two points that are highlighted in the journal article that we're going to talk about um, in a second, which I think is one of the reasons why we chose this article to be discussed. Um, because I think especially as students getting involved in research and kind of encountering research on the everyday level, um, these two points and these two recommendations were really important to us. So just a very quick clinical example of why is this important to us. Um, so I kind of just looked at it at myself. Why is it important to myself and how did I come about this idea of um, disability and accessibility in my practice? So I took the example of capacity um, and using a capacity assessment in patients under the Mental Capacity Act. So whether they would have the capacity to, to decline treatment. So there's four key parts of the capacity assessment. So that's to understand information, retain information, weigh up information and communicate the decision. But as part of the Mental Capacity Act, the patient is not to be treated as unable to make a decision unless all practical steps have been taken to let them be able to make that decision. So sometimes when we're communicating information, it's not always accessible to all populations um, and therefore it might influence their ability to fulfill these four criteria. So the way we need to make sure that um, as healthcare professionals or in whatever profession you are doing, that we're providing that information in an accessible way. So the things I thought about very quickly were just communication boards um, and sign language, and they were only just like a few, and that's more communication difficulties. But when we're thinking about, say, learning difficulties, maybe condensing down information um, and using less jargon terms. So that was a real quick kind of background on disability and, and global health and then a quick example of why it's important. So this was the kind of article that we sent out before and that we chosen to discuss. So I'm going to hand on over to Saloni who's going to quickly talk about what the article involved. Hey guys, so I'm just going to provide a brief overview of the main barriers that the researchers at the university faced when trying to investigate um, the potential barriers that people with disability have when accessing healthcare services, and also mitigation strategies adopted by students um, and recommended strategies for the future. Um, next slide, please. So there's approximately 9% of the population in Bangladesh that lives with some sort form of disability. But unfortunately, because there's not a lot of knowledge on the issue and not a lot of research that's been done so far, um, they're often perceived to be either hypersexual or incapable of reproduction. And even people with of some form of disability feel discomfort in discussing this issue. Um, lack of research also has a lot to do with cultural context because it's considered a taboo topic. And despite the fact that the Persons with Disability Welfare Act was passed in 2001 and the Persons with Disabilities Rights and Protection Act was passed in 2013, there hasn't been a lot of effort by the government to actually implement um, this legislation, which is why not much has happened since it was passed. Um, next slide, please. So the study was a nationwide mixed methods research to explore the sexual and reproductive health rights and needs of people with disability, their health seeking behavior and barriers they face when accessing healthcare services. Um, the minimum sample size was 5,670 respondents, but there was um, a response rate of 87.1% because several people with um, cognitive disabilities could not be interviewed. The paper that we're going to be discussing today highlights the challenges that researchers in the team faced when conducting the research. And all of the challenges that are discussed are based on the personal experiences of the researchers. So five of the main challenges that researchers face are going to be discussed now in brief. 
The first was development of appropriate tools with questions on sensitive topics. And the reason behind this was often because it's considered a culturally taboo topic, questions had to be rephrased. So for example, instead of asking someone directly whether they've engaged in sexual intercourse, they were asked whether they've had a romantic relationship because the words were considered too direct. And because a lot of people were dependent on a caregiver or family member for um, support in daily activities, their caregiver was present during the interview, which meant that there was an additional role um, in, in getting consent for the study. So obtaining informed consent was another barrier. It involved an additional step in the research. Um, so the interviewers had to explain the whole study, not only to the respondent, but also their caregiver. There was also difficulty in maintaining privacy while exploring sensitive issues. Often when caregivers were around most of the time, the respondent felt uncomfortable exploring sensitive topics. And it was also difficult to gain consent or permission to use a private room because the interviewers mot motives were questioned. This is also due to, due to the fact that people with disability are often seen as, seen as easy targets that can be taken advantage of in um, society. Difficulty in exploring sensitive issues was also another problem. Response, respondents were not comfortable opening up and used to hide their perceptions. In few of the data collection sites, people got offended when they were asked very private questions and several respondents were reluctant to share their history of abuse regardless of what kind of abuse it was. Um, communication difficulties was another barrier. So there was a person that was that new universal sign language present in every room, but often the respondent did not know universal sign language and used local um, forms of sign language, which only their caregiver or family member understood. So it was harder to collect data from them. Next slide, please. Um, so these are some of the mitigation strategies that, that were adopted by the research team. Um, the research team, when trying to improve their tools and questions, visited disabled people's organizations and NGOs. And this really helped formulate questions that were more sensitive to the context of the interviews. They also got to learn that barriers for people trying to access sexual and reproductive health services were of four types. The first were physical barriers in where the, there's less access to hospitals and healthcare facilities, attitudinal barriers where there's negative attitude of healthcare providers and caregivers and other healthcare facilities. There's also um, communication barriers. So failure of healthcare providers to communicate and consult with people with disabilities and financial, financial barriers where there's high cost of medicine and expensive health services. So all of these were incorporated to formulate questions for the interview. The process and the study object objectives were explained in detail, not only to the respondents, but also to the caregivers to obtain consent from them and also to obtain consent to have the interview in a private room. Um, when the family member or caregiver was too, closed, was too close to the room or the respondent felt uncomfortable, often the interviewer would just change the question to a more general topic, such as the rights of people with disabilities. They also built rapport and trust with the respondents and often shared their own experiences before asking a question and provided the respondents with information about health and judicial services in case they needed them in the future. Gender com compatibility was another important mitigation strategy. So if the respondent was female, it was often that the interviewer would also be a female. However, this changed when the caregiver was present um, to respect the cultural context. So if the caregiver was a female, but the respondent was a male, then the interviewer would be female because it would often involve the interviewer speaking directly to the caregiver rather than the respondent. And anyone un un uncomfortable with disclosing any sort of information was not forced to do so. Questions with dichotomous and open-ended responses were asked to the respondents directly with the help of the caregivers, but those that were more intimate and personal were not asked in front of the caregivers to ensure safety and privacy. While interviewing people with mild to moderate hearing impairment, researchers spoke loudly and slowly to ensure there was enough time for lip reading. 
However, if the respondent was able to read but could not communicate, they could fill their own questionnaire with the assistance of a researcher. For those with mild to moderate level of impairment, simplified questions were formulated. However, people with severe intellectual disability were not, be, were not interviewed as they could not understand the questions or respond. Um, I'll now be handing it over to Millie to initiate the discussion. Thank you so much for that really good um, overview of the paper. So hopefully if you um, weren't able to have a read of the article, you kind of get a good idea of what sort of things um, it's included. So now we're going to go ahead to the discussion part of the event. So I think because there's so many of us, um, we're going to try and split out into breakout rooms. So we're going to give you about 10 minutes um, just to kind of talk within your breakout room about what you thought about the article and um, how you think it will affect your kind of future practice in whatever area you're you're working in. So kind of what key points you're taking from the article um, and how you think it might influence future practice. And then we'll come back together after 10 minutes and we can kind of have some people feedback if they wanted to. Yeah, so I think we're gonna put you into breakout rooms now, just bear with us uh, one minute just to try and get you all in.
Welcome back, everyone. I think we should have everyone back from the breakout rooms now. Um, cool. I really uh, enjoyed listening to some people's discussions, and that was really um, good. And I hope you managed to talk to some pe new people and to have some good discussions about the article. I think maybe for the next five, 10 minutes, we could invite a couple of people if they feel comfortable and want to, um, to share just kind of one key point that they got from their discussion. I think people should be able to um, unmute themselves. Maybe if we do on the reactions, if, if you want to speak, put like the thumbs up reaction. If you don't know how to do that, you go on like the bottom screen and press reaction. So if you feel like you wanna share something, you can stick your thumbs up and we can invite you to unmute and maybe share something. Uh, Asha, do you want to unmute and share something? Um, I think we were talking a lot about um, trying to sort of not, trying to include people more and being more sort of inclusive. Um, I think especially talking about at the beginning, you know, the statistics of if you say like 15% of the world sort of have some sort of like disability, um, especially sort of including this paper, it's about how we include everyone and like not building up walls to say it's too difficult or too challenging because it's a vulnerable group. It's actually how do we sort of include more voices because obviously people, like lots of different people make up um, a lot of society. Um, and we're also talking about sort of intersections and intersects that um, a lot of like disabled people will intersect a lot of the different vulnerable groups that we'll be talking about as well. So that was something we found quite interesting. Yeah, I think those intersections are really key um, factors to think about. Um, kind of people don't just belong to one group and there's lots of intersections in there that play. Thank you very much for um, sharing. Anybody else want to share a key point? Artie, I think you just put in the chat. Sorry, I've made it hard Hi. back. Button. No, don't worry. I just can't. I can't find a button for some reason on my laptop. But um, one thing that um we highlighted or spoke about um was to do with the communication difficulties. Um, we read that there was someone who was able to read but couldn't communicate badly. So instead, they filled up a questionnaire um with the assistance of a researcher to um convey their opinions and feedback. Um, and what the researcher kind of highlighted that this universal design is recommended with people with disabilities so that they can take part in research in their preferable way without facing any difficulties and um, our group just discussed that perhaps there needs to be more focus in the future when we're talking about delivering it into practice um, in future um, coming up with more strategies universal ways that people not just to people but marginalized groups can take part but instead of just being pigeonholed saying oh this is your way to take part um you get a questionnaire perhaps there can be multiple different ways you know a plethora of a plethora of um situations and they can choose to be more inclusive yeah that was just one of our key points that's a really important point about the communication um methods that i got from the article definitely thank you very much for sharing um, Tanzina, did you want to share? Um, hi, um, so I was just saying that uh, my parents are from Bangladesh, so I was actually very impressed with the research because I know how hard it is to talk about sex sexuality in, in Bangladesh, uh, also because there is no division between the government and the religion, so it's really a taboo talking about this kind of topic. And especially disability, people with disability are stigmatized, especially if they are not wealthy. So wealthy people can actually go and seek for treatment. So um, they're not stigmatized for their disability, whether if you're poor, you don't get the help that you need to. So the government actually does not help you. So it's very difficult to implement strategies and policies uh, because you can't really talk about this topic. Thank you very much for sharing. That's um, really interesting to know and kind of gives you a different perspective on the article. Um, and I think as well, when we were talking about, I found this article interesting with the sexual health aspects of it and had that kind of double stigma 
um, so that was there. Uh, Navanith, did you want to share something? Yeah, I think in our group we were more talking about how the fact that in uh, developed countries such as U the UK, we are facing the same exact same problems in terms of talking or communicating with disabled people and listening to uh, their needs just as much as uh, what's seen as a less developed country like Bangladesh. And it's crazy that, you know, we have to not, we can't even like do certain research studies. We have to make research studies about how to do those research studies because we can't, um, like we, don't know what to do and it's not even that we don't know what to do actually we were talking about uh, so a person in our group talked about how we already know everything we know what we should improve on it's just no nothing is happening now and it's not been happening for years and it's, it's something to think about and I feel like um, we need to start from university level like we don't know I don't think many of us know how to talk in how to sign language or um, know how to communicate with people who aren't that norm of that like what's seen as a normal spectrum and to, like things like this talking about it more will help people understand more but I feel like we need this to be taught for people teaching us if that makes sense like the universities need to know to teach us all of this we shouldn't be telling them they should be telling us so yeah thank you very much that's a really good point about us um the university should be teaching us. That's really interesting. Thank you. Um, Jashraya? Hi. Yeah, we were uh, discussing in general, not in particular with SRH, but how in terms of um, healthcare that uh, has health professionals, we should be uh, able to communicate uh, in simpler terms um, with regards to treatment procedures and uh, the treatment options available so that uh, even people with disabilities can uh, have, their, have their own right uh, to choose um, or refuse the treatment. Uh, so, so that uh, sort of uh, equity should be given uh, uh, just like how we would give it to normal people for health. Yeah, that's, that's one thing that we wanted to share as a group. Thank you very much. Um, AR, did you just put your thumbs up? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so in our group, we were discussing about how sometimes we feel that it's difficult to conduct research among disabled people because we feel that sometimes, you know, they won't be participating. But Helen worked with a lot of disabled people and apparently she says it's easier and they're very willing to communicate and participate. So yeah, that, that's what we found interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I think this paper was really good at highlighting the difficulties, not necessarily just in practice, but I think the research aspect was so core to the article um, and how research is needed actually to progress um, things. And we need to combat these barriers to research in order to combat everything else. Brilliant. Thank you so much for sharing, everybody. Um, I'm going to Just for the final little part, um, there we go. So yeah, I just wanted to highlight some further resources. Um, if you wanted to read any more about this topic or you kind of wanted to explore it more. So the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine actually have a free online course for global health and disability. So it's run through Future Learn. Um, if anybody's used it before. Um, so you can go on there and take a short course, um, through, which is organized through them. I think you can pay a fee to get it certified. If not, you can just kind of learn for interest. Um, and from personal experience, those future learn websites have um, a fantastic kind of wealth of global health um, short courses that you can do. So I'd really recommend having a little look on there. I've also just got the links to the World Report on Disability that we spoke about before. Um, they have the full publication, which is like a lot of pages, um, but they also have a short summary and a short fact sheet. Um, so we can share those on the Facebook event and to, through the email as well afterwards if you wanted to have a read. Um, and lastly, just there's a really good charity, I think it works mainly in Asia and Africa, called ADD International that I discovered that does a lot of work of breaking those 
barriers down for people living with disabilities, um, especially in developing countries. And also, unfortunately, we couldn't coincide with the 3rd of December, but there is an International Day of Persons with Disabilities on the 3rd of December. So just to kind of keep that in mind, um, if there's any events going on near you. So that kind of concludes our first event in the short course. Thank you so much for everyone to, for being so active and um, participating in the discussions. We really appreciate people's engagement and we hope you learned something and hope you enjoyed it. Um, so we have a feedback form here. Hopefully the QR code should work. Um, I'll also try and pop the link in the, in the chat afterwards. Um, so yeah, as we said, if you fill out this feedback form for four out of the six um, events, then we can give you a certificate. Keep an eye on our social media for information for the rest of the short course events. And hopefully we can see a lot of you next week for our next event, which is LGBTQ plus experiences in healthcare. So we have some great speakers coming to speak to us for that. I'll just put the link in the chat now for the feedback form. So the link's in the chat as well if anybody uh, needs it. Thank you very much for coming and we hopefully will see a lot of you next week. <laughs>